Hey, what's going on everybody? So today I lose my dignity and I give you guys one of those videos in a list format. I hear from the cool kids that this is all the craze and that anything without a number attached to it is invalid apparently. So let's dive in and take a look at the top 10 things that people get wrong about home networking. So number 10, more bandwidth does not equal lower latency. I see you gamers and a lot on this list is aimed directly at you. I see it all the time. My ping is off the charts and I'm lagging so much I'm worried I might warp space time. I need a faster connection. While you may be right, there are a lot of variables that come into play here and just because you upgrade from a 10 megabit connection to a 200 megabit connection it doesn't necessarily mean that your ping is going to decrease. You have to factor in the distance between you and the server you're connecting to, your home wiring, your current network load, how you're connecting to the internet, your equipment that you're using. There's all kinds of variables here. So just because your connection has more bandwidth doesn't really mean that your ping on League of Legends is going to go down. Number nine, not knowing when something is your own problem. We've all done it. Blame the ISP when something goes wrong. Again, there's times where this may actually be an issue with your service provider, but there's also times where this is not the case at all. If a service tech shows up to your house and tests your shiny new gigabit holy grail of the internet connection at one gigabit, then they're delivering what you paid for. If you're only seeing about half that speed on your device, then guess what? Probably your problem. ISPs aren't going to troubleshoot your house wiring from 1958 if they didn't run the connection into your house themselves. And they're also not going to spend any time troubleshooting your shoddy equipment if you aren't leasing it directly from them. If your Amazon delivery guy delivered 10 packages to your front door, but when you got home from work, your wife and your kids had opened and lost half of them? Sorry, it's your problem now. Number 8. Thinking everything is a router. Oh, it's the small box with an ethernet connection. Must be a router. What's this thing? Router. How about this? Router. This? Router. Wrong. All-in-one devices make our lives so simple that we just default to calling every box that has to do with an internet connection a router. If you've only got one box, then congratulations, you're correct, that is a router. However, it's also a modem, switch, access point, and a server dumped into a bowl and blended to perfection. Remember this thing? Not a router. If you bought this and replaced your home router with it, then you'll be calling someone real quick when your internet doesn't work. Number seven, replacing equipment while not knowing how your network actually works. This goes along with thinking everything is a router, but it goes a little bit further when you start looking into upgrades and crazy things you want to do with your network. So you researched a custom DNS server, saw you could make your loading times better, or that you learned that a switch has more interfaces than your current router? Well, let's throw a pie hole in here and replace our router with this switch for more interfaces. Congratulations, you broke everything. Your network needs a plethora of services working in tandem in order to function properly. The more specialized the gear, and typically the more expensive, the less user-friendly it's going to be, and the less of these services it's going to actually do itself. DHCP, DNS, and NAT are all services provided in the background that often get overlooked. If you know what needs to be running and where, you can be successful at adding specialized equipment to the mix. It's almost like you're in Formula One racing with a complete pit crew, but you find out there's a guy who can replace tires in the blink of an eye. You're not going to replace the entire pit crew with that one guy. Seems pretty simple, right? Number six, assuming a megabit is the same as a megabyte. For the love of God, learn the difference here. The great gods of technology have graced us with 146 and a half different measurements for the exact same thing. I've seen this a million times and I've been guilty of it myself in my youth. Picture this, you order that sweet, sweet, new high speed 100 megabit connection and the service tech installs it. As soon as they leave, you start up your Fortnite download and what's this? I'm only getting 12 to 14 megabits of download speed. I've been robbed. The ISP's cheating me. No, the ISP delivered exactly what you paid for and even a little extra. The difference is that the downloads are typically measured in megabytes, and internet connections are sold in megabits. Don't ask why, but when you're dealing with network speed, it's always going to be in bits, and when you're dealing with file sizes and downloads, you're going to be dealing in bytes. Remember the rule of eights. Divide your internet connection speed by eight in order to get your file download speed, and multiply your file download speed by eight to get your connection speed. This is basically like buying a car advertised to go 200, then you get in it, find out it can only go 125. The real difference was that it was advertised in kilometers per hour, and you tested it in miles per hour. Number five, not understanding interface speeds, or NIC speeds. This goes along with number six and not understanding what speeds you should be seeing, but this is because of your equipment interfaces. With Ethernet, you have three standard operation speeds. 
10 megabit, 100 megabit, 1000 megabit. I guess we could mention 10 gigabit, but we're not really going to get into the weeds here with the special ones like 2.5 gigabit, etc. But realize each interface in your connection path has a theoretical maximum transmission rate. Nowadays, these are mostly all 1 gigabit, but there's still quite a bit 100 megabit ones around. Take Raspberry Pis, Steam Links, stuff like that, for example. Those all function at 100 megabits. So if you just upgraded to gigabit and you still see speeds around 100 megabits, make sure there isn't something in your network that can only function at that 100 megabit speed maximum. Fun fact, I've actually seen an ISP deliver a 200 megabit home connection and provide a router with only 100 meg interfaces. This isn't common, but it's happened, so be aware of what speed your interfaces are. Number 4. Not understanding network overhead. Keeping with the trend of the last three items, let's talk about the network overhead. It's the silent killer of speeds. This becomes more pronounced at higher speeds, which is why you see a lot of people complaining about only seeing around 800 megabits on their shiny new gigabit connections. Each time a packet is sent, there's some additional information used up by headers, footers, tags, etc. This takes bandwidth that isn't translated into actual data that you're seeing. Typically, the network control traffic eats around 4-5% to of your maximum bandwidth right out of the gate, but it can be as severe as about 20% with some certain traffic. This is why even if you have a 100 megabit interface or connection, your speed is going to be in the mid 90s, probably around 94 to 96. Things aren't wrong, that's just how these things work. This is also why they give gigabit interfaces for 100 megabit connections, and they deliver more than the advertised speed. This means you won't really notice the overhead, but at 1 gigabit, it is extremely noticeable since not all interfaces are 10 gigabits by standard nowadays. So you're actually seeing that overhead and 20% out of a one gig connection is a big chunk of bandwidth. Number three, thinking a program is gonna make your internet faster. I'm not gonna spend much time on this one. Just do a quick search and download any of those programs. They'll claim that they'll make your slow connection fast, false. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Number two, Debating which garbage router is the best. Alright, so this is actually kind of a valid point. However, most of the time the expectation of what we want from a router is unrealistic. I have to restart my router every weekend because the internet stops working. Which router should I replace it with? Valid question. However, if you stay in the consumer range of gear, you're going to get consumer performance. All-in-one modem router combos are nice, but they're not going to excel at anything in particular except looking cool and having flashy specs. Let's be realistic. Most consumer routers are manufactured by the same companies, and they use the same cheap components. There's a reason that things get exponentially more expensive when you look at enterprise-grade gear. The best solution is going to be one that was designed to run 24 7 and take a load consumer routers are designed like toilet paper made to give your ass some comfort for a price but still be thrown away after they see some shit i should also mention that some routers claim ungodly speeds use your brain most of these are physically impossible outside of a lab and this brings us to number one complaining about network performance while on wi-fi all right here we go I've seen this one a million times. Why is my connection so slow? Why is my latency through the roof? I can't get more than 50 megabits on my phone. Well, there it is. For the love of God, stop benchmarking your connection on Wi-Fi. Sorry, your $400 Nighthawk with 1500 megabit claimed wireless AC is not going to actually push gigabit to your iPhone. Especially not across your entire house. Advertised Wi-Fi speeds are notorious for being wildly inaccurate. These are theoretical maximums that are only possible somewhere in the vacuum of space. Even on the newest wireless AC, you can probably only expect to be pushing around two to 300 megabits realistically. And if you remember right, that's the speed wireless in claimed. So please stop complaining that your gigabit connection isn't up to par on your Xbox. It's just not going to happen. Same goes for latency. Wi-Fi competes with other radio equipment and channels can get crowded. This leads to interference, which leads to a cruddy connection. Always use wired connections if you really care about performance. It's almost like buying a MotoGP motorcycle that can rip up the track in less than a minute and a half. But you're not Valentino Rossi, and your superbike is too impractical to take to the grocery store, so you drive your car instead. Sure, you got something that's capable of setting records in the garage, but you choose to take the convenient route. So there you have it. There's the top 10 things that people get wrong about home networking. And it's also probably 10 of my pet peeves. It probably sounded like it in this video. Now, let's be fair. Let's bring it down a notch. You can argue most of these. Not everybody thinks these. We have certain expectations, and what we read is kind of what we expect to get when we buy something. So it's not a bad thing that you don't really know all of this, but you should be aware of all of the intricacies of a home network before you start tinkering with it or start calling people out. 
especially your ISP. ISPs can be a big pain in the ass, but a lot of the times it is user error. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll hope to see you in the next video.